really, we've got one very simple question that we'll try and address uh, as part of this closing discussion, which is what are the challenges going forward? So it's not a small question, really, but plenty of scope. Um, so what we're going to do is open it up to the floor here for questions to start with, uh, after we've just had a brief introduction from each of the panellists from their views, then we'll open it up to the floor. We've got some questions that have already appeared up on Slido, as we mentioned earlier, so we'll take some from the Slido questions that have come in via social media, and then we'll return to the floor for some final questions from the floor. So that's how we're going to, to, to work it. So there's just an opportunity to start with for each of the panellists to just say a few words about what they feel the, the main significant challenges are going to be going forward. Uh, I don't mind. Which way do you want to go? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a slight uh, advantage that I, I think I'm the only one who was announced on this panel, so I, I knew that question at least uh, since yesterday. So I do have actually some thoughts prepared. I mean, they're not so super surprising after what we said earlier. So I think um, there was a very good question after our presentation about what about all those logical approaches to AI. And of course, to say we actually don't really talk about the reemergence of AI in that kind of 1950s, 60s uh, idea of a human uh, a kind of machine that is acting like a human, but we do talk about the usefulness of machine learning approaches to various ranges of disciplines. And I think we've seen today lots of examples, not least here in transport. Um, so what we have seen over the last couple of years is basically that uh, we moved away from this kind of grand vision of AI towards very applied versions of machine learning. And I think maybe it's now the big challenge to uh, think again how we can move beyond those individual tasks towards something that is really helping us all improve lives and make culture and society somewhat better through AI. And I think then you have several uh, problems. The first one is clearly um, a kind of uh, practical one, so how do I engage people in these processes? What kind of uh, critique can I develop of these material conditions that I mentioned earlier, without which there is no ethics? And then there's also a lot of questions around um, research. So if, if you are in a research institution, you should never forget that you should talk about your own challenges. So I think we heard a lot about today uh, about how we can redesign practical research processes. So uh, that was the web science talk we heard earlier about. But there are actually some foundational problems too. Just two days ago, it was as another workshop in Brussels. And there one of the big topics there, what is actually a fair algorithm? I don't think we have any kind of answer to that question uh, yet. So there's much more fundamental questions about the conceptual frameworks that we are involved in. So these are our little challenges. Okay, um, I have to confess, I did actually find out yesterday I was on the panel, so I, I have had time to prepare. Um, I'm going to take a slight, slightly sidestep from, from the things I was talking about. Um, whenever we do questions of travellers and things about what they think about um, being monitored, generally we end up with getting back two extreme views. Uh, we get the group of people who just say, well, yeah, it's fine, whatever. And the group of people who say, well, no, absolutely any form of monitoring whatsoever is completely and utterly un unfair. No, stop it immediately. The reality probably lies somewhere in the middle. That if we understand exactly what the information we're all sharing is, and what uses, and understand properly what uses it could be used for, good and bad, uh, what the benefits, what the consequences, everything else are, we would probably all take reasonably rational, pragmatic kind of views as to whether or not we wanted to share that data. The difficulty we've got is that the pace of technology is so fast that it's going to be very difficult for the general public to ever actually keep up with what the potential of these things is. And therefore, we're always going to struggle to actually get to a stage where people will be able to make informed decisions. And this is why we end up in a situation where we end up with legal decisions being made that essentially they have to say, well, okay, uh, the legal position on all data is this. And therefore, we're almost, always to a certain extent limiting ourselves by essentially um, not understand, not actually having a real discussion over what data we want to release, 
and what data we don't want to release and how that varies by, by individual people. And whether or not we can move from a, a world of, I'm going to say ignorance about privacy, because I still think we are, uh, to one where we actually have a proper understanding of privacy is going to be the big challenge going forwards. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to join the panel. I didn't know um, <laughs> until a few hours ago, so I think my thoughts would be very incoherent at, at this stage, but I'll try. Um, I have three kind of quite simple points, and they build on some of the discussions that we had through the day. Um, so one point, I think Susan is, is not here now, um, is about, again, kind of going back to this question of the distinction in data between what we say and what we do, right? And this tension, how do we close the gap and what kind of data we use to understand what people say and how does that relate to what people do? Um, and to me, this is an important, uh, both a practical question in terms of how we negotiate what people say to us, right, in different contexts um, and what people do, but I think also uh, politically, if you think of some of the discourses around, again, security, radicalization, use of hate speech, what you might check on the internet, what you might say, what you might write, what you might read, and assumptions about what you might do, I think these are really, really important questions, right? And they are not, they are not the same. Uh, but I think we need to come up with better answers, and this will translate in the kinds of data that we use and how we use the data. The second point that I want to raise, and this is kind of in connection, I mean, it's, it's been really productive for me and also challenging to hear you talk about different domains of knowledge, right, and the uses of data. And one thing, again, uh, talking like a political scientist, one thing that struck me is that the data in all of these domains is also now used for security purposes, right? So we have this in universities. I mean, the example was um, was brought up where, you know, data about students is kind of collected and universities have to use it, right, to, to track um, students tier four. Um, visa students, right? Um, we have this in relation to health data, so this data is mobilized. We have it in relation to transport data, right? So if we think of Oyster Card and the use is not just by the, by the police and kind of, um, you know, kind of finding out information after somebody has committed a crime, but actually, again, preemptively, before anyone has done anything, right, to kind of find patterns of travel. And to me, it's really interesting that then how you travel becomes a proxy for what you might do in the future, right? So I don't know, I'd be really curious to hear more about this. And uh, of course, this is linked to the kind of history of um, also air travel, right, and what we know about the kind of uh, terrorist attack, but how, how that, that has been translated into security issues. And I think that's something really important and a challenge for us to think about what data we can use, right, for something quite different in our daily practice. At some point, um, it's called upon, right, and it's repurposed and reused. And I'd be curious, actually, what GDPR, to know what GDPR would say about this, right, and where the state is in GDPR, in particular the security services, where they are. Um, and finally, I think it's a, for me, it's a challenge in terms of research data, right? Because one of the question is, um, why is this data, who owns the data, right? Why is this data produced? What is our relation going to be um, with these commercial companies that produce a lot of data? What kind of data universities will produce, right? What, what the relation is going to be? Um, but also what will happen to our research questions, right? Our, our, all our research questions going to be geared towards the data that we have, like shaped by the data that is already there. And what about kind of research questions where there isn't enough data or not sufficient data? How are we going to, um, to deal with that? And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I found out I was on this panel uh, last night, received an email. I didn't read the email properly, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm coming to this very cold. Uh, however, um, my personal tragedies aside, I, I, I think well, one thing that really, so, so in fact, continuing your point, um, I think we really, what, what we really need to get over, uh, certainly to policymakers, I think researchers are much more clued up on this, but, but getting over to policymakers is that data uh, has a social life and that conditions how it functions, what makes it powerful, what makes it useful, or, or indeed not useful. 
Um, there's a kind of assumption, at least at the policy level, that the relation of data to reality is completely unproblematic. And data is, a, is an uncontroversial reflection of what's going on in the real world. And there's an even more pernicious and dangerous assumption that and the data is a complete picture. Uh, and of course, neither of those is true. Uh, just just uh, uh, working with crime data, it, it's very interesting to see how the data about a crime will evolve during the course of a criminal investigation, whether charges are laid or charges are dropped. At some point, that data goes off to the Home Office to become part of uh, the open data uh, crime mapping releases. Uh, and that kind of fixes it in a particular form, but it'll still be evolving back uh, with the, the, uh, the individual police force. Um, and the data will have been created quite often by a policeman or policewoman in, in, in extremely stressful circumstances uh, with, with little standardization about things like geocoding. And, and so you know, it, it's a very imperfect relation with, with, with reality. And that kind of social life of data, the sociology of data, I think, is just not very well understood. We, we think of data as a, as a kind of uh, a, a simple reflection of reality, whereas actually it's a, it's a social artifact that, that has a life uh, and, and has power. I think the, uh, I mean, the, the other thing that, that, that kind of occurred to me when, when, when uh, Ben was talking is that, there's this, that there are very interesting notions of particular harms that don't get translated very well in very rules-based systems. So the American system of privacy and, and data protection, which is rather more based in common law than our own Data Protection Act system, responds to harm. I mean, it's not as universal. The coverage is not as universal, and it's inferior in many ways. On the other hand, it does respond to particular perceived harm, sometimes at an absurd level. So, uh, because someone was once murdered because of information that was received about her from her video uh, rental store, uh, it's now illegal to give out information from video rental stores, uh, which is like highly specific and, and now completely useless uh, rule. Um, but at least they focus on harm. And, and, and there's a particular kind of thing that uh, came, came up when uh, DeepMind had its recent contretemps with the um, information commissioner about health data that it was processing. Uh, there's a big difference between you processing data in order to train a machine learning algorithm and processing data in order to make decisions or bring about interventions in the world. And that's not really respected. It, it, it's in the GDPR somewhere, but it's not really respected. And, and th this idea that data processing itself is a blanket process that can't be, can't be broken down into more or less significant acts uh, seems to me to be a weakness of, of GDPR. And of course, we're stuck with that for for one or two decades, there's not very much we can do with that, but it is something we have to live with. Thanks very much for that uh, wide-ranging selection of thoughts on what is already a, a, a broad topic. Plenty of food for thought. I hope it's inspired a few questions from, from the audience. I know we had some that were held over as well from other sessions earlier today, so hopefully some of those do map in <coughs> to those, those comments. Yes, we'll start at the back there. Context is extremely important and also how you define the whole thing. I wanted to mention all these because I would like to mention that I am the personal face of what would have happened to me with data and all that. Because up to last year, I was on a tier four visa. And again, we are highly monitored as a foreign student and all. And the university actually told me that if I had proceeded with my um, what is it, application for leave, they would have no choice but to revoke my tier four visa. And back home in Malaysia, I would have to reapply. For the simple reason, and this is again the definition and the context, I worked full time for the university during the summer as uh, one of the staff. But to them, that destination was considered holiday. And therefore, when I wanted to go back um, during Christmas, that would have been tantamount to taking too many days of leave. And therefore, if I proceeded with my application for leave, they would have no choice but to revoke my tier four visa. So, you know, going back, that looks at the context, the situation and everything else. I have to say I wasn't very careful because on a verbal, I checked, but verbally with the student office, they said, no, you're fine, you can go. So when I got an email, I was not in UK. 
So only two of my friends knew about it and they were petrified, I was petrified. In fact, bless them, the two of them thought that there would be border guards trying to catch me at Heathrow because basically the letter, the email from the university from this new destination which was the visa compliance manager, that was um, 2015. So maybe when we're looking at big data, you know what, I'm really very glad that all the data was not linked because very easily when I arrived back in Heathrow, I would have been checked if my you know, visa, passport and everything else had been there. So I'm frightened actually, so what can you say about that? Well, uh, I mean, part of that, of course, is, is our local political context, where for some reason we treat foreign students as a danger to the country, uh, when, as we know, only about 40 or 45 percent of them are. Um, <laughs> I, I think context, you, you're absolutely right to, to mention context. I think that is really important. And how does data come about? Data comes about because large organisations, the state, uh, big companies, uh, want to make us legible to them so that we appear and they understand us and they can manipulate us in ways that, that interest them. Which means that uh, all our complexities are broken down, our, individual, our individuality is not of interest to them. What's interested in, what they're interested in is what categories we fall under. And as we all know, whenever we fill in any form, it's extremely difficult because there's always something where you think, well, you know, I, I could fill in three or two there or, or whatever, and it's always really difficult. Context just gets lost. Uh, and, you know, if, if you were to make a complaint about this, someone would say, oh, but look, only one and a half percent of people have complained about this process, so it's all right, isn't it? Well, you're a hundred percent of you. Uh, and it matters to you, uh, but you know, that, that's the way systems work. They, 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 they kind of make us legible to them, and they don't make themselves legible to us in return. Um, if I can add something to that, the other question to ask is, why is the data that is collected the data that is collected? And the short answer is, quite often, we collect the data that is the easiest to collect. Yes. And it was therefore quite easy to collect the fact that you were not doing something or, or somewhere, but it was very, very hard to collect the context, the, the actual information about what you were doing. Yeah? And, and therefore, ge generally, um, we always suffer from the fact that um, quite, there's quite a lot of things which we are legally obliged to collect in terms of data, um, whether it's monitoring of our students or, for example, I mean, the, the example of the transport is the air quality information. Um, there are va various gases and things that you are required as a city to monitor. Um, and they are essentially the ones which it is easiest to monitor. They are not actually necessarily the ones which are most harmful to your health. Um, so the, the data that is collected, the data that is, is, is recorded, is, not, is very often not the data you would actually want. It is the data which it is cheapest and easiest to be collected at a large enough scale. I just wanted to ask a question about happiness. Um, I think I'm from Sheffield originally, and I think we were one of the places that was involved in this, how happy is our place, our town. And I think we were encouraged to actually meet, to, to mention it on the Twitter, and then some sort of face lit up on the town hall, and we meant we were all really happy. So, and some of the discussion today, we're talking about the stress that data is causing. So I just wanted to ask the panel members if they could clarify what to them would be happiness in the way that data could be used, if that's possible for you to say that. Well, there's, there's, there's two deeply unsatisfactory ways of measuring kind of happiness. One is to extrapolate from certain, uh, certain uh, parameters, and you, you know, like you know, you're earning so much, you have so many children, you have a religious life, whatever it might be. Um, uh, and you, know, you then can extrapolate from these, or, or go the other way around, uh, find, uh, do surveys of whether people say they're happy and then sort of generalize about it. Um, and, I mean, these, these are all fine, except, of course, sort of it's generating data that we didn't really particularly need or, or want or can do anything with. Um, and yet it generates policy measures. So, 
you know, I mean, I, I used to live in Sheffield, it was a very happy place, actually. Uh, so I'm not surprised that Sheffield's terrible. I mean, smiling away, uh, <laughs> very, very cheerful. Uh, and quite right, too, because it's a lot better than Rotherham. Um, <laughs> but um, it, these things generate pressures. So if Southampton found out it was less happy than, than, than Sheffield, right, there'd be a budget for this, there'd be a little happiness uh, czar who'd be created and uh, would have to go around cheering everybody up with a tickling stick or something. And it's the way we respond to data. So it's not the data, it's, I mean, of course you can collect whatever data you like. Uh, as it's when that goes into the policy process that weird things start to happen because data is such a, a, a strange representation of the world. You know, we're used to understanding the world through narratives, through you know, our, our personal experience of being of living in a particular place and, and kind of you sense the mood. It's all very phenomenological. Turning that into a piece of data is, is just you end up with very odd things happening if you then base policy on that. But there's no reason not to do it. But um, I won't say anything about about happiness because I don't know how you would measure it. I mean, first you'd assume that it has to be a state that somehow you know. Continuous in some in some way. I think they just ask people that. That's that's the <laughs> Possibly, yeah, and that kind of t takes us back to what would people say, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. kind of if you get exactly. asked, you know, the question that you ask is really important. As again, you know, social scientists know that how you ask the question kind of has a big role in the kind of answer that you get. But I want to say something about the limitations of ethics because I think that's important because we talked a lot about you know, what ethics would mean and how we distinguish ethics from law and you know, what are the implications of ethical subjectivity. Um, but I, I think it's, there's really an important point and I feel quite ambivalent about the kind of dominance of ethics in debates about data, technology, computing, and so on, because it's often associated with a set of rules that you can just implement. Um, and I think the discussion today tried to move away uh, to some extent from that. And it seems to me that questions both in, in relation to, to both your points, that you know, questions of power, of politics, right? Uh, but also of not just of money, but a kind of political economy, because it also makes a difference um, you know, what kind of tier four visa you have, because in practice you will see that some tier four students will still be treated differently from other tier four students, mm -hmm. right? So I think we need to be much more attentive to these modes of, to these hierarchies, because we are not governed the same. We know that, right? So there are all of these distinctions, and part of these distinctions within groups of population are really, really important for the modes of governing. So, so to me, and in kind of the work that um, I'm interested in is try to actually both understand how these distinctions come and these different modes of governing, they come into being, and how, what data, how data brings them um, into being, particular forms of data, but also think the other way, what can we do about them? How do we contest them, right? Uh, because in your lucky case, right, it worked out because of the lack of interoperability, and I'm with you on that, right? I think interoperability is actually hard to put in practice, um, but thankfully, although, you know, there's kind of a lot of move to make all sorts of databases interoperable and kind of data fusion and so on, it doesn't <coughs> work so well, but I think we need to kind of think about, you know, the limits of that and how we can also, again, we come back to contestation, how we can contest some of these practices exactly because the facts of the use of data are actually so differentiated. Okay. <coughs> so I, I need to now say, sorry, that's the last thing about say about happiness. So this is of course, I don't know what happiness is, um, but it's a fundamental question actually in the history of philosophy because the question is, if you do the right thing, are you also the happy person coming out of the right thing? So there's a famous situation of uh, a person who uh, basically, um, I don't know, name now the philosopher, there's this idea that a murderer knocks at some person's door. Is the person supposed to tell the murderer where the, person, where the murderer can find his victim or not? Yeah? And the right answer for that philosopher was to say, of course I should tell them where the victim is because only the truth leads to happiness, right? And so there's some kind of discussion since the beginning of this debate around ethics 
how can we actually ensure that if we do the right thing, we're also the happy people coming out of it. Uh, and I think that is where I would rather do the distinction rather than trying to measure happiness. I find that very difficult to do, as I think. And I think there's also something about sometimes you should simply resist and that everything is measurable in life. And maybe that's simply the fundamental distinction you should make. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. So this is the last one from the room. Oh no, we've got two at the same time. Mine's left field, so you're just putting Okay. <coughs> Audience agreement. <laughs> Lots of talk of um, social media throughout the course of the day, specifically Twitter. If you were uh, in the Oval Office advising the Donald um, about uh, his tweeting behaviour, what would your advice be? <laughs> yeah, great left field question just, to finish. Just, so, uh, okay, now, uh, now it's an interesting question. If I now assume the Donald, that for that, if I'd be able to advise him, I know to assume that he's a rational being. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I think, to so say, well, more I can judge from his behavior is I'm not even sure he wants to be a rational being, if you see what I mean. So maybe that is his trick in life, you know? So basically, don't advise me because I do what I want anyway, and all I care about is power. And that, in fact, is, I think, a very dangerous political configuration, if you ask me, and that's a very dangerous situation we are part of. And I think you can have some honest debate about whether social media contributed to this, the whole question of whether it actually destroyed some kind of public, yeah? a public in the sense of having a rational discourse together or even a public simply in a shared interest way of thing. So I don't think I would want to advise Donald because I don't think it helps. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd advise Donald Trump to do anything different, but I might advise his press secretary to throw a few extra tweets in occasionally, um, just to explain that this is not actually official government policy. Um, <laughs> that, that being serious, however, there is in, in most in most representational governments around the world, there is the tradition of the leak, which essentially is we are having thoughts along this kind of line. Let's let the population know about them now to see whether or not they would have support for us to take them further forward into proper policy development and things like that. Um, in many ways, if you see the Donald's tweets as being kind of like initial thoughts on things that may or may not become f further developed, depending on what the reaction to them is, then they are just a continuation of what we in this country may well be essentially the front page of the Guardian, Daily Mail or whatever. Um, as being government thinking about this, what do, what do the public think before we actually spend too much time about it? I probably, I would go, I, I wouldn't advise, uh, but you know, kind of politics is my field. So politics as practical kind of goes back. There's a whole tradition about thinking as polit of politics as practical. So I think that's where all this, um, you know, kind of social media comes in. But there's a second, um, element I think that's quite interesting, well, which to me, I, tr I read it um, as a sort of governing through chaos, right? And kind of it's, it's part, I think, of a way of governing where no one knows actually what's, what's going on or what's going to, to happen next. But I th that has a particular effect. And I think in terms of how we thought about diplomacy, how we thought about political negotiations, this was not Right, what diplomats are doing, and, and so on, and I, I think we need to actually think both about the relation, you know, to the public and the kind of this this democratic kind of um, discussions and deliberations, but we also need to think about what has been, to some extent, successful in terms of this kind of mode of governing through chaos. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise anything at this stage. I think. Yeah. Um well, if I was advising Trump, and, it, and if the point was to um, to improve Trump's position, I mean, if I was standing at Trump's shoulder, I would be very tempted to set fire to his hair. Um, <laughs> but if 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 Trump has a strategy, and that's a big if, uh, it, he he clearly likes creating uncertainty and throwing uh, throwing all assumptions out, and and when when we come to a situation. 
no one knows quite what's going on. And that's worked very well for Donald Trump. But it's not clear it's worked very well for anyone else, but it's worked very well for Donald Trump. So the advice to Donald Trump would probably be, well, we'll carry on, because, you know, it, it, it's kind of working for you. If I was advising the world's media, I would say, why do you not cover this man less than you actually do? Because it's, there's a bit of oxygen that you're giving him that he needn't have. Uh, and I mean, a final point I would make, uh, and, and this goes back to something I said when I was answering uh, a question earlier. Um, when you look at what Vladimir Putin is doing to weaponize big data in terms of fake news, and when you look at what uh, Xi Jinping is doing in China to weaponize big data to kind of develop more social conformism, to get people to self police and self censor, actually, the Donalds messing around on Twitter is probably the least harmful of the three. Though still harmful. <laughs> Excellent. Well, what a, what a good finish there to our closing panel. Um, I'd just like to thank again the panellists for taking part, and particularly to those people who'd stepped in at short notice due to some unavoidable availability. So thanks very much, and can we give everyone a, a round of applause? <laughs>